Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, It's Time to Be Identity Aware. I'm Shay Mann and I will be your moderator. Today's webinar is in listen-only mode, so if you have any questions throughout the event, go ahead and submit those in the Q&A panel and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We will be recording today's session and we'll email you a link to the recorded version tomorrow. Joining us today is Jackie Brinkerhoff, Director of Product Marketing, and Rick Weinberg, Senior Director of Product Management. We've got a lot to cover today, so Jackie, I'll pass it over to you to get us started. Okay, thank you, Shay. So just real quick, uh, to set expectations for our webcast today, the agenda will flow as follows. I'm going to cover today's security challenges and give you an insight as far as what's going on and transpiring in the market. And then we'll be handing it over to Rick to handle uh, and discuss about what is the identity aware enterprise and what does that mean to you? And how does that uh, manifest as far as how SailPoint can address that? So it's really no surprise that data breaches are the new normal. Each morning we wake up and it's not uncommon to hear or read about the latest incident that's transpired in the news. And so why is this the case, you may wonder? Well, Exposure points have exploded. And so what does that mean? Well, most companies, probably just like yours, we've all been going through what's called a digital transformation. And unlike the days of old when we as employees used to show up and go to the office and access the network and do our work and then go home at the end of the day, this digital transformation has completely changed that, the way that people are doing business now. We've started to incorporate now open business borders which make it easier to, for people to collaborate. And also, we've extended those um, borders to allow people like contractors and vendors and partners to come and access our network. And all of this is contributing to evolving the company, making your company more competitive, and also becoming uh, much more uh, successful. So these open business borders also provide a lot of convenience. So that way people can be doing work from anywhere across the globe and at any time. But if you can imagine, if you don't have to be a mathematician, but if you start multiplying the number of, the number of applications and the access that takes place, there's a lot of exposure points, a lot of points of access that actually get included or uh, brought forward. And with every point of access is a point of exposure. And you see the hackers have also been going through their own digital transformation. So now they've turned to social engineering and targeting the weakest link in your security infrastructure. It's no longer trying to just hack through that network perimeter. But really what they're doing is they're starting to a, a target your people, target us. And so that is the most common attack vector, are the people within the company. And according to Gartner, by 2020, a typical small enterprise Identity program will span 1 million people, 10 million things, and billions of relationships. And as we all know, it only really takes that one time, that one time where someone within your organization happens to be clicking on an email or opening up that attachment and happens to get malware downloaded onto their computer. And the credentials then at that point are compromised and the Hacker gets in. SailPoint conducted a market poll survey earlier this year and surveyed 700 IT leaders at global organizations. And that survey revealed that 60% of you actually believe that your company is actually going to get breached this year. It's become a given that we're all going to be targeted in some way. So it's no longer, if you hear the term, it's not if, but when. It's actually a reality now. But another startling number here is one-third of them admit that they probably, they believe that they won't even know when it actually happens, when they actually will get breached. And why is that? Well, when the bad guys end up compromising one of your users' accounts, they will typically hang out in your network looking for that so-called digital gold. And in fact, on average, it takes 200 days for a breach to even be detected. That is, that's the time from initial infiltration to actual detection. So if you think about it, kind of like having a creepy guy hanging out in your basement for half a year. 
And how do these organizations find out that they've been breached? Well, unfortunately, it's when their data appears on the dark web. In fact, once they've stolen your digital gold and they post it for sale on the dark web, it only takes about nine minutes for them to monetize the data that they stole. And not only that, if you can think about it, it's the gift that keeps on giving, since they can keep selling this to countless number of buyers. And by the time companies find that they've been breached, the information has already walked out their, their door. So if you've never been on the dark web, I'm going to take you on a little field trip. You ready? Okay. So this is an actual screenshot that shows what can be found on the dark web. We have information such as credit card details, personally identifiable information, otherwise known as CII, health records, or even tax records. They're all available. And all for different prices, typically based on the quality and the lifespan of the information. So for instance, with a health record, that could go for like 60 to 100, 100 times more than a credit card record. And you have to look at why that may be. So we're talking about lifespan. So with credit cards, if they happen to steal that information, if you're actually paying attention to your credit card statements, you may notice a fraudulent charge. And then the credit card hopefully then gets shut off. So the lifespan is pretty short. But if you got if, if they've stolen something like health record information, or even if they've broken into a school system and stolen the child's information, that could be years before they've act, you've actually identified that your identity has been stolen. So that information will go for a lot more money. So let's go a little bit deeper. So this might be a little bit easier way of looking at this. So here's that same type of information, but presented in a read more readable format. And you can see that the data records here are ranging from 40 million to 360 million accounts. They're all being offered, and the currency of choice here is Bitcoin. And I'd like to point out that all of these are in stock. I don't know if you can see that, but it's great customer service. Um, all this information is in stock and not on back order. So he, here's something that might be a little familiar. This is the Yahoo information, the Yahoo breach. So if you've been following the latest updates on the Yahoo breach, the count is actually now up to 3 billion records that have been stolen. And this popped up. This particular item popped up soon after the LinkedIn and Tumblr post, and we can see that it's currently offering 200 million of the Yahoo accounts worldwide. But what is within these records? So as you can see, there's quite a bit of sensitive information here. And keep in mind that Yahoo had no idea that they had been breached at the time. And it actually took two years for the breach to be revealed and acknowledged. But we're not going to go there. That's a different story. But what we are going to talk about is what is the result for our company, it's your company? And so first of all, the big one is the financial loss. Uh, the market poll survey that I talked about earlier, we, it estimates that the average cost of a data breach last year was $4.1 million. But if we think about the Yahoo breach, we just saw that that cost Yahoo $150 million in their value um, when during that uh, Verizon acquisition. And these costs certainly don't include the cost of brand damage, if you think about it as well. And so now new regulations are also getting more serious, and they're putting liabilities on the corporations who can't prove that they've done what they could to prevent the breach in the first place. You probably may have heard or you will soon hear about a new regulation that's rolling out coming from Europe called GDPR. And GDPR, I won't go too deep into this, but basically this new regulation really impacts any company that collects or houses any kind of information with regards to a European citizen. So even if they're coming to your website and you're collecting information from them, you are subject to this regulation. And if you're, fined, uh, if you're found to not be in compliance, you could actually be fined up to 4% of your company's annual revenue or 20 million, 20 million euro. All right, so now we can probably all agree that these breaches are expected, they're still happening, they're still growing strong, but how are companies now addressing their security efforts? They're addressing security by becoming an identity-aware enterprise. And what that means is controlling and governing access to every user that touches your network. You can think of it as a human perimeter, if you will. 
and as each user or identity accesses applications and systems and data that they need to do their job, they're doing so based on a set of established rules or governance controls that have been established by your company, your IT and security department. And those rules basically define what is and what's not appropriate <coughs> access for each role within the organization. And what's at the center of the Identity Aware Enterprise? It's rich and valuable information regarding each identity. And we refer to that here at Cellpoint as identity context. Identity context holds critical information about each of your users, including the relationships they have to other identities, to other groups, and as well as the relationships to resources across the organization. And it houses information about the state of the identity, the policies that apply to the identity, any governance controls, meaning such as user IDs and information, and as well as the history of what that identity has access. What makes this so valuable is all the context not only powers your identity governance program, but when placing identity at the center of your IT and security infrastructure, you can actually share that across the IT and security investments that you have, and that will work to enrich and up-level what you're currently getting out of those investments. So in short, identity context basically helps make security policies more identity aware, and in turn, make identity policies more security aware. So at this point, Rick, I'm going to hand it off to you, and you know, mind, let's go a little bit deeper. Okay. Thanks, Jackie. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk through a little bit about SalPoint's approach to identity governance. And really, the, the term governance itself, you know, people ask me all the time, what do we mean by that? It can be a pretty broad term. Uh, but when you really break it down, it's enabling organizations to be efficient, compliant, and secure. Uh, and so this, you know, allows many of you, when you have it, to, to really gain more sustainable confidence to, to execute and grow the business. Um, so how do we do that? Well, one of the first things we look at to be efficient are some things like, you know, enabling day one provisioning. That, that's really allowing users to quickly get access required in the day that they start their job. Uh, at the same time, you know, we always recognize that, you know, all the access can't be prescribed. So there needs to be a means to simply allow for self-service access request uh, that really empowers the end users to request the access they need, you know, rather than letting a, a manual request trickle through the help desk. Um, another significant challenge uh, here is to maintain efficiency is during the job change. Whether an employee who got promoted or, say, a contractor took on a new project, there's transition time that's needed uh, to ensure that, that workplace continuity. Uh, movers need their old access for at least a few weeks, if not more, while they transition out of their old role. And, of course, what often many times happens is organizations fall into the trap of, of not letting that access go away in the transition time. Um, and finally, you know, there's an expectation for tight integration with, uh, for larger organizations, often multiple HR sources, uh, as well as service management solutions that really enable you know, organizations to leverage SailPoint quickly and you know, offer end users to, to have much more closed loop visibility to any help desk ticket, ticket that they uh, you know, have that, to ensure it's been completed. Be compliant, right? SailPoint really helps you pass uh, internal audits or, you know, or adhere to regulatory mandates like GDPR that Jackie mentioned or HIPAA, SOX. You know, and we do so by really delivering relevant identity audit trails and periodic certification of access, really assuring the right users have the right access at the right time. Uh, now, many organizations have, you know, some process in place to be in compliance, but is it truly scalable? Is it really sustainable? You know, at, what we're often seeing now with many of our customers is, you know, more and more applications are being governed as they scale out their identity governance deployments. Uh, but as you do that, the byproduct is it can add more compliance fatigue to the managers that are reviewing that access. And so we really help navigate the noise by discerning what's risky and what's not. And the other aspect here is it's one thing to manage user access on an application-by-application application basis, but the real value with identity governance is delivering that holistic view across so that you can properly enforce uh, potential conflicts in that access. Right, we're not going to give healthcare professionals the ability to prescribe or dispense and dispense medication or, say, financial professionals 
the ability to, uh, you know, uh, have both accounts payable and, and accounts receivable access. So really, you need to have effective definition and enforcement of separation of duty conflicts. Uh, so, the, you know, where those violations may exist, you can remediate that access that's not needed, potentially allow for exceptions where it is. Uh, but at the same time, you also can prevent those SOD violations from occurring in the first place uh, during, say, an access request where they're going to detect it, it before that access has even been granted. And then there's being secure, right? Uh, you know, in many cases, organizations can be compliant but not secure. And so to prevent that, it's really critical to get that complete visibility uh, of who has access to what. Now, there's two aspects of, of visibility. First is the, the breadth. Right? It's not just your cloud applications, you say, or within just your Microsoft environment or particular, you know, application set. It's visibility across all of your enterprise applications from everything from the mainframe to ServiceNow or Salesforce. Um, and then it's also depth, right? Not just who you are and what accounts you have, but what can you do with those accounts? What are the entitlements associated with those accounts? And even more so, down to the file and folder level, you know, who has access to that uh, 2018, you know, forecast file in the sales folder, uh, and more importantly, how do they get that access? Uh, these are some key capabilities that we help can provide in that level of visibility. But it's not just visibility, it's also translation, right? It's, it's making it so that you have effective translation of what access is being provided and how they got it, and that really helps the business users truly understand if the access is needed. Uh, I mean, I don't know if many of you have seen sort of the a cryptic Active Directory group name, but it, there's really no way you can tell what's behind that. And so you need that translation. Um, suspicious behavior is another area, uh, you know, that, that we, you know, want to make sure that we can mitigate against. And the first is being able to respond to that. And it's kind of a two-sided coin, right? First, um, before any risk can be mitigated, we need to enable a quick response. And as Jackie pointed out earlier, this is, this is really sharing out the notion of identity context. That really enriches an organization's security posture. Uh, so, so that you can inform, uh, say, your security information and event management administrator more details behind that abnormal activity that, that they see. And then the second piece of that is to be then to apply the, the, the controls uh, to mitigate that behavior so you can disable the access if it warrants it. So, you know, that gives you really a, an opportunity to get just a high level view of how organizations and cell phone can help you become efficient, compliant, secure. I want to look at some more recent innovations that really help you become that identity-aware enterprise that, 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 that Jackie mentioned. So before we dive into some of the innovations, I want to give a little bit of context here with our open identity platform. Now, SailPoint has an open, open identity platform for really two reasons. The first, with such high demand for identity information, the need to share that identity access information out is so significant right now. We see, we, 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 make, we really want to make this easily available so we can share that identity context out uh, to the broader IT ecosystem, as well as the second piece is, is how you can mitigate that risk by, again, applying those identity controls, whether that's done natively within SailPoint or invoked from a third party, uh, whether it's, you know, that would be invoking controls like a policy violation or disabling the account or triggering a certification. These are all things that you would expect out of your centralized, you know, identity management solution. Now, so SailPoint, you know, takes this, this open approach, uh, and, and when you look at this uh, platform, it really is, is, is split into three tiers. You have our top tier of the core identity governance services, things like access request, identity analytics, provisioning. Uh, but then you also have our platform services that really serve those core governance services. These are things like the identity warehouse, where you aggregate all your disparate identity information from various different data sources and normalize that information. Things like a workflow engine so that you can configure the approval steps that are applied in an access request setting. These are foundational, again, to those core governance services. Uh, and then, you know, we have a, a, our, our connectivity tier that integrates with the disparate target systems and third-party solutions that are out there, again, spanning from the mainframe to your cloud apps. And, and our integration framework uh, allows for that, whether it's leveraging our core connectors or, or APIs to, to apply the uh, integration between the two. So when we look at some of the investments we've made, you know, particularly in the open identity platform, this is really enabling customers and partners to develop product extensions and integrations in a standardized manner. Rather than companies going to customize their solution differently in each different direction, we wanted to provide a much more comprehensive and standardized way to do that. 
Uh, and so the first way that we've done that is, is really by investing in a plug-in framework. This really extends the out-of-the-box functionality to create these extensions. Uh, it reduces the need for any custom coding and, and really simplifies the administration uh, where we offer a management console that helps enable and disable plugins themselves. Uh, of course, a big part of this is standardizing our APIs, making sure that they're versioned. And so we have you know, the means to invoke in, uh, an account, an entitlement, a role, a workflow, policies, all you know, from you know, outside uh, SailPoint itself. Uh, and these are all REST-enabled endpoints uh, that we also are based on a SCIM standard. Um, we continue to invest in, uh, you know, strong, robust uh, connectivity opportunities with our web services integration where we can easily integrate with any REST-based API-enabled applications and have a very intuitive configuration interface to allow for that. And at the same time, as you create these plugins and these artifacts, it's making sure that you have a consistency in the user experience between what is product and what is plugin so that, that the end user really has no uh, distinct difference in what they experience. And we do that because we share the same uh, components and libraries with our, our UX framework that we leverage in the product. And so we've seen a significant number of uh, our partners leverage that open platform. And, and, and we've attracted a number of different third-party vendors that you see here that have really chosen to integrate with this approach. Uh, and this program is really defined in a way to you know, help enable that open identity infrastructure. And so these different categories, it spans different markets and sub-markets from privileged account management to security information and event management. You know, IT service management, or even enterprise mobility. Uh, there are a number of different integration sets that, uh, that the different vendors can plug in and, and expand the value of that open identity platform. Now, another area that we've invested in significantly in the last uh, year is, is how we continue to, to extend identity governance to really manage sensitive files and folders. And historically, organizations have done a, you know, an adequate job of, of administering and governing their, their users and their applications. But when you're really looking at getting granularity of file on a folder level, it's, it's very difficult for, for organizations. And the, the challenge with this is the explosion of unstructured data that we're seeing uh, really exacerbates that problem because there's a significant amount of, of sensitive uh, intellectual property that resides in that unstructured data. So that governance at the file and folder level becomes even more necessary. So we've invested uh, in, a, in a robust set of capabilities that includes being able to discover and classify data itself so you can detect, you know, what is some PII data that might exist there out in a file share and how should you effectively control that. Uh, but also having an analysis around how that, how that access was delivered. Was it directly assigned or is it part of in a nested group where you're part of a group that's part of a group that's part of a group, right? When, when you have that nested access, it's very difficult for your organization to understand, one, how you got it and two, to govern it. Um, and so providing visibility and even the beans to normalize that is something we can provide. Um, the other aspect with, you know, providing management over files and folders is ensuring you have the right personnel to do so. And so we've allowed for the ability to uh, assign data owners and elect them to effectively govern that. So these are leveraging business users who have a much better understanding of, you know, how should this data be used and who should have it. Uh, and then being able to review that and remediate it if necessary. And then finally, it's, it's also recognizing how we can see user activity where there may be alerts on abnormal behavior. Say you see a large spike in the download of a sensitive folder or a file in a folder. That can, trigger, that can trigger a mitigating control around suspending the access itself, right? And so it's seeing those alerts on those file shares as an example and, and then, again, applying that back into the identity solution to, you know, to trigger the control. And then, you know, another big area that we've seen a significant demand for is governing privileged access. We've made significant investment here. Now, this is just to be clear, this is not SailPoint offering privileged account management. It's us integrating with best-of-breed PAM solutions like CyberArk or BeyondTrust as an example. And, and we really offer the ability to simplify and centralize the administration of user access. Uh, this is really meaning that all your requests, your provisioning, your certification services are inclusive of not only your non-privileged access, but also your privileged access. So that when you do a certification campaign, you have the opportunity to see that that user also has a, a privileged access as well. 
So how do we do this? Um, well, we're really, we've invested in, in delivering more of a, a container level view, right, that has permission level granularity. So now so you could look at your own, say, your Unix test environment uh, and see all the identities, the groups, the privileged items and manage them. You can even really search and, uh, and filter so that, you know, administrators can quickly query who has access, which can be a significant pain for many privileged administrators who have, a, say, a large server farm as an example. And but we've done all this in an open standards manner. You know, the integrations I mentioned with the third parties is using a skim-based integration, which really allows for much more rapid deployment and, and it really a greater return on your existing PAM investments that you've made. So I thought we'd now take a moment to walk through really what an identity-aware enterprise actually looks like. Uh, and, and we have an operational scenario here we want to work through with you and, and showcase. This is Billy, <laughs> and Billy is part of our fictitious company here. He's, he's worked uh, here for several years, just came out of college after graduation and has been here for, you know, I think, about seven years now. And, you know, he currently works on the, the say, the web content team and, and, frankly, at this point, knows practically everyone in IT and the company itself. Now, he's been employed long enough to, to have acquired, frankly, lots of entitlements, or as we like to call it, entitlement creep. Uh, so, you know, these are, you know, access that continues to be granted as Billy has, you know, moved on to different projects or moved on to different roles. Um, so he's got a lot of accounts with a lot of access. The other piece of this is he's, he's got connected to, you know, say your enterprise mobility management as part of this. He's got SSO access management to, say, his uh, uh, Azure, uh, you know, AD Premium or his Okta, you know, solution in the cloud. Um, he also has access to on-prem applications. Um, he may have, you know, also access to the enterprise privilege account management. Here he, you know, has access to the production web servers on his, uh, you know, that where they're actually publishing content. Um, he also, of course, has multiple SaaS applications, his Workday HR, HR account, among others. Um, and finally, he also has, you know, access to many file shares, shares that contains all kinds of important and sensitive data uh, on it. And really, you know, if you think about this, you know, while Bill, Billy's been at this company for a while, when you look at this scenario, I'm sure this is not too different than what many of you are facing, where you have a, a combination of sets of access um, that apply. So now let's move into, you know, how our story plays out here. This is a pretty typical situation uh, where you have a vulnerability and an exploitation. You know, unfortunately, Billy, you know, like many other employees that we see in the workforce, you know, has been using his company laptop for personal reasons. And, 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 and as you might expect, he, you know, downloaded some dubious content, which unfortunately contained a zero-day vulnerability. So what's happened here is Billy got owned. <laughs> you know, the bad guys got, you know, really got a keylogger wedged into his desktop. And so when Billy came in to the office in the next day, you know, he logged into his SSO account, and then he moved in and accessed his PAM vault. Uh, and then from there, he went into his company's file servers, and during this whole time, the bad guys are watching. And so now they have access to everything. Uh, one of the malware packages that the bad guys deployed contained a WannaCry variant, you know, which we know <laughs> is not great news. And it, it started encrypting the files and in the finance share. So this is just an example of how things can get exploited and, and through that access get applied to some very sensitive IP. Now this is really where the identity aware environment can kick in and start providing some of that enhanced detection. You know, fortunately in our scenario, Billy's company has leveraged you know, SailPoint's identity governance to, to, to their file shares. So the technology was watching and monitoring the file share like a hawk. Uh, you know, and so you immediately noticed that there were odd behaviors happening, and frankly, this is the telltale signs of a ransomware encryption. You know, at the same time, you know, we're watching over the access to the applications and the systems picked up by the lifecycle triggers. You know, as the bad guys use Billy's account to pull lateral movements and escalation of privileges, They've done that within the rest of the environment that was really, fortunately, identity aware in the process. But this started the alarm bells going off. You know, at the same time, this is, because this is an identity aware environment, Billy's company has implemented a use of identity analytics. And this, you know, really allows, you know, to have, you know, all three solutions being integrated and working together and applying a much, you know, smarter approach to governance itself. You know, and all this data within these solutions is available, you know, as Jackie pointed out earlier, this identity context, right? It's, it's about having the relationships, the states, the events, the history, the policy, and the controls uh, so that you can have, you know, your configurations you know, and, and how that's connected to the rest of the infrastructure. 
And in this case, you want to make sure that uh, that identity where infrastructure is listening and consuming to that, that context that we're providing. You know, and that applies out, right, to, you know, drives action across numerous solutions and then shares that status back to SailPoint. So really, this, is a, this enhanced detection allows for a bi-directional relationship between SailPoint and these numerous different solutions, and it enables much more informed, effective governance. Now, let's think about how we respond to this uh, and, and what that looks like within identity-aware infrastructure. You know, the first piece here was to suspend Billy's Active Directory account. As, you know, as soon as the activity was detected, the account was disabled and basically stopped the spread of more files getting encrypted. Uh, and this, of course, is a very effective way of controlling the proliferation of that vulnerability itself. But it doesn't stop there. You know, the other side of this is using the SIM integration module where we can really get instant visibility into the events coming from the log and the SIM tiers themselves. You know, at the same time, we can trigger a bump in Billy's uh, incident and identity risk score and that really pushes critical file classification and access configuration information out to the CASB and DLP tiers. And this really helps SailPoint, you know, when we know something bad's going on, we can then push our file classification out to share those, you know, with those systems. So whether you're using something like, a, say, a Symantec or a McAfee, you can make more of an informed block and, and mitigation decision because of that. And in this case, everyone's sharing in this identity-aware ecosystem. And then you know, this identity context is enhanced further because it enriches your access management solution uh, that is controlling the, the single sign-on of the authentication to, say, your key cloud applications. You know, at the same time, it might be able to apply a different MFA policy that enforces, you know, for all of Billy's current and future sessions so they can shut down access in real time and also ensuring that there's a stronger form of authentication the next time that Billy tries to log into the system. So the story's not over yet. There's now an opportunity for even some more enhanced controls and governance, right? The, the first piece here is being able to recognize how you can apply governance and certification of the affected PAM vaults that are out there. You know, the second piece of this is also recognizing how you can put policy checks and attestation in place for all our key systems, whether those are on-premises or in the cloud. You want to make sure that there hasn't been any escalation of privileges that have taken place. You know, and then, of course, you want to do a full review of everything that Billy has access to. Uh, we can, you know, automatically create the certification and send it to his manager. You know, something happened last night, so let's take a close look to Billy, you know, before we let him back down any, any system, uh, you know, so that, that, that may not have been compromised yet. So, you know, and lastly, this isn't all about the system and the infrastructure. When you think about applying a strong security program, it's making sure that it's designed around the users themselves, and therefore you have to have a strong user experience. Um, you know, whether those, those users are of affected systems in our scenario come to request access to a system, uh, they're going to go through a stronger approval process. You know, we're in a state of alert, so you need to effectively triple certify everything. You know, when Billy gets his identity back, we can make sure that we reset all of his passwords and our automation layer can handle that. You know, at the same time, with analytics and intelligence capabilities in hand, we can realize the enhanced peer groups and outlier assessments so we can allow managers to make much faster and more intelligent decisions on what they're governing. At the same, as well, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but governing sensitive files and, and file shares can really engage regular business users that become those data stewards, right? That, that we can engage them early on in the security process, allowing them to provide the context that they, don't, that they have the true understanding of. And it also helps assist the help desk staff by, by having the visibility to the access you know, the people they're talking to on the other end of the phone can be incredibly helpful. This is such a thing as who they are, what they have access to, how they got that access, you know, and what are they doing with that access. And, of course, that better informs the security staff as well. You know, they get smarter information. They have access to that context. You know, they're part of that identity-aware ecosystem. And then, of course, finally, you look at how this lends back to our compliance folks. And giving the compliance team visibility into the controls is essential so that they can ensure that we're in compliance. So th that just gives you sort of a snapshot, an operational scenario of what an identity-aware enterprise can look like. You know, as you look forward to establishing that in, in your own organization, it's, it's really critical uh, to do so that you want to need to look for opportunities to maintain and share that identity context out. Uh, so you're connected and, and can be responsive uh, and be able to provide more of that informed governance. 
Uh, and at the same time, you can enhance your security operations and IT operations. And all this together just allows for better insight and, and provides, again, much more of an informed governance experience for your organization. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, for some Q&A. Great. Thank you, Rick. Okay, let's go ahead and jump in, and we'll answer as many as we have uh, time for. So our first question, um, Rick, this may be a good one for you. What are some best practices to think about when looking to implement an identity-aware infrastructure? Where, where's a good place to begin? Yeah, and I mean, this is tough because, you know, every organization is coming at this from some different vantage point of, you know, what they may have or what they may not. I think the first thing you want to look for is a solution that is open, that can share that identity context, right? It's really important to be able to uh, expose that so that you can make your broader IT security and operations more effective. At the same time, you want to be able to, to consume the triggers so you can apply those controls. Um, so I know many of you have uh, existing investments, but you want to leverage those, right? And so if you have a solution that's open, uh, you're able to leverage a lot of those existing investments that you've made. I think the second piece, too, to factor in is that um, you want to look for a solution that is comprehensive, but start small, right? So you want a solution that has the breadth. You know, you can only measure what you, you can see, right? You can't, you can't govern what you can't see. And so you need to have the breadth of uh, means to have connectivity across all your disparate, you know, hybrid IT environment where those applications exist on premises or in the cloud. But you also have to have that depth. It's one thing to have an understanding of who has an account on a system. It's another thing to have the granularity at the file folder level. And so you need to have a solution that allows for that depth. But as I mentioned, you've got to start small. You, you want to be able to get that quick win out of the gate. Thank you, Rick. Okay, next question. Um, I have apps that are hosted both on-premises and in the cloud. Can Identity IQ support that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, this is kind of the, the other aspect of the last question I answered in terms of the, the breadth, right? So SailPoint, you know, has a, a strong uh, inventory of, of connectors that, that support uh, everything from, you know, your mainframe to your Salesforce, your you know, ServiceNow. So your, your cloud apps to down your mainframe, your on-prem apps, you know, whatever they may be. Um, we've got about 90 plus uh, different connectors. At the same time, it's also, we have strategic integrations. So those connectors are typically doing your standard create, read, update, delete on those target systems, change password. Um, but it's also strategic integration. So whether those, uh, those uh, uh, integrations exist on premises, say you want to integrate with an SAP GRC, or you want to integrate with ServiceNow into their service catalog, uh, where there are much more strategic integrations in delivering something beyond just your standard uh, connector capability of create, root, update, delete. So we, we have that exposure and uh, management of those cloud and on-prem resources. Great. Okay. Um, you discussed PAM in your example. Um, do you support other PAM vendors? Yeah, so our Identity Plus program uh, has a number of privilege access management vendors uh, that support this integration today. I mentioned CyberArk and Beyond Trust. That also includes uh, Lieberman and Psychotic, among others, that, that support that integration that I mentioned. Someone's looking for a sensitive file management demo. Um, is there anything that we offer around that? Yeah, you bet. Uh, so if you go out to our website, we, we definitely do these uh, demos on a consistent basis. So if you go out to the website, you can either um, find the, we call them demonars, and um, you can find a sign up for that, or if uh, you're not able to quickly locate it, just click on the contact us button, and that will send a request in to us, and we'll answer straight away. We can get you signed up. Can you talk about how SailPoint integrates with an access control product? Yeah, I think that uh, this might be talking about sort of your, you know, multi-factor authentication. Um, yeah, well, as many of you know, the number of form factors that exist out there uh, today for multi-factor authentication are countless. And so, um, you know, we have a means with which to apply uh, step-up authentication uh, in our products, you know, at the time of authentication in. But at the same time, if you want, if you're locked out of your account or you want to perform a password reset, or you might want to provide that step-up authentication. And so out of the gate, you know, we have integration with the likes of Duo and RSA. Um, but also we've, we've invested in a framework for uh, that multi-factor authentication. So if you have a, uh, a form factor from some other vendor, you can apply that integration uh, accordingly with the, with the framework we've invested in the product to allow for that integration. 
Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Keep an eye out for an email from us tomorrow. That will include a recording of today's presentation. What also will be included that's a great asset for you is a link to our identity score survey. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes and it can really let you see where you stand with your current identity efforts. Not only will you receive your identity score, but we'll send you a personalized report with recommendations, best practices, and tips to strengthen your identity program. Again, that will be sent to you tomorrow via email. Um, Rick and Jackie, thank you for your time today. Thanks for everyone who joined us, and we hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.